And there I went to the University of Texas and was distracted by sex, drugs, <laughs> rock and roll. That's why I spent my junior year abroad so I could get distracted by drugs and sex. <laughs> Well, Kathy, first, where in the hell were you born? <laughs> and did a witch lean over your cradle and give you three wishes or something? You know, I saw the Disney movie Enchanted over Thanksgiving, and I think you are an enchanted kind of person. Oh, well, that's very sweet. Thank you. Um, I was born a long time ago uh, on the south side of Chicago in an area called South Shore. Chicago girl, good Midwestern roots. And you didn't mind the cold weather or anything? No. You haven't minded anything since you left Chicago, <laughs> is that it? I just hope that everybody in the audience someday can be introduced by you, Liz. I mean, you know, <laughs> well, you have that opportunity. I should live so long. Where did you go to school? And did it have... <laughs> I should. Do you and love her shoes? Do you love those boots? Oh, my love goodness. Love those boots. Love those boots. Oh. So where did you go to school, and did going to school actually have any effect on your <laughs> life and your success? No, but the nuns did. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good answer. I, uh, I went to parochial schools in Chicago, and I went to a woman's college in uh, Washington, D.C., Trinity, a Catholic woman's college. And well, I like to say that the 16 years of ed education of, of, the, of those nuns kind of put us in the right direction, because at that time, um, there were very few, univers very few colleges open to women when I started college. And so that's kind of what you did. We went to a women's college, which was fantastic because we were the presidents, we were the cheerleaders, we were the, you know, the editors of the newspaper, the editors of the yearbook. I mean, we were told we could do anything that we wanted. And that was really, that was really inculcated into our whole learning. And I think it had a, a great deal to do with my thinking, you know, I can do anything, that's even though true. it wasn't very easy. Yeah. And there I went to the University of Texas and was distracted by sex, drugs, <laughs> rock and roll. That's why I spent my junior year abroad, so I could get distracted by drugs and sex. Well, were you always determined to break into publishing or be a journalist, or maybe you envisioned yourself as the president of the Hearst Magazines, or maybe president of the United States? Well, I certainly didn't imagine myself being president of Hearst Magazines, but, but truthfully, and I actually mentioned this in the book, um, one of the little projects when I was in about second or third grade was that we all in our class had to sell the local Catholic newspaper to our neighbors. And it didn't occur to me that somebody who wasn't Catholic would have very little interest in subscribing. <laughs> so one evening, a friend of my father's called and said, Jim, Kathy is going to have a great career in sales. He said, not only am I not Catholic, I have not been to church in 25 years. And she just sold me a subscription to the New World. So I think maybe it was kind of that newspaper thing was kind of in my genes way back then. You do. OK. Now, Basic Black is a really good looking piece of publishing from Crown. And whose idea was it to put part of the text in black and put part of the text in red? And what's the difference? I must say, it's admirable. It's so easy to read. It's so much fun. Well, I think it was a team effort between Crown, the publisher, Crown Business, which have been great partners all the way throughout this whole project. But really, when I, when I thought about doing the book, many years ago, a well-known literary agent by the name of Mort Janklo approached me when I was at USA Today. And he said, I think that you really ought to be telling the story of USA Today. And it just seemed early at the time to do that, because it was such a heroic undertaking for all of us. I mean, truthfully, when I was at USA, it was before the phrase 24-7 was invented. But if you think back to there was no national newspaper other than the Wall Street Journal back in 1982 right. when the newspaper actually launched. I was recruited in 83. And so when I, when I thought about it, I was part of a very large company, Gannett. Um, and I just, it just didn't seem right at the time. So I, t I called a friend of mine, Joni Evans, whom you know, another literary agent. I said, Joni, let me come over and talk to you. What do you think about this? And she said, you know, Kathy, when you're alone in a big company, they're very happy for you to walk off the high dive into an empty pool, which was very good advice. She said, you will, there will be a time when it's really right for you to do something that'll be sort of part memoir, part management book, part of story of lessons learned, but it isn't now. And it was great advice. It's a long time ago. It was probably 1987 or 1988. But over the last few years, it's just seemed as though kind of the stars were in alignment. I had um, three, two or three writers approach me 
two or three literary agents approached me saying, all right, look, you're not retired, you know, you've had a great career at Hearst, you've got a great story to tell, and you have a lot of wisdom and lessons to share. So all of a sudden I thought, you know, you know what, she's right, they're right, let's get on with it. Right. And it was a fascinating process. I worked with a, uh, I worked with a collaborator, Lisa Dickey, who I chose, which is really kind of a weird experience if anybody in this audience has ever had the experience because there you are interviewing somebody whom you don't know that you're going to tell your whole life story to, which was actually rather peculiar. You but, mean you didn't sit down and write with a feather or do anything? Like that? Thank God for computers. No, no <laughs> feather. Um, actually, the way that we worked was that um, Lisa spent a lot of time interviewing me. She kept a tape recorder and had a computer, I mean, had a, had a laptop. She talked to other people, of course. And then we would get together and kind of um, debunk either what people were telling her. And as we sort of began to kind of come up with the organization, we came up with the idea of sort of the stories, the case studies. But at all times, she was always pushing. It would have been very easy for me to just tell the story. You know, what was it like to pitch Oprah? What was it like to do USA Today? But she was pushing for the lesson to be learned for the reader. And I think that's really what has made it a very helpful and motivational, but a very helpful book of like, wow, I could do that. And so that was kind of the process of how it all got started. And that's why we don't get a lot about your sex life in it. OK, <laughs> well, that's all right. My children are in the audience. <laughs> oh, thank you. You lucky children. Uh, they might like and, that. And Joni Evans is also in the audience. Oh, she even bought her own there. ticket. I mean, she's a prince. So what do you mean, let's get right to it, what do you mean when you advise making passion your strategy? Well, you know, I think so many younger people, and when I started the book, I said, in fact, when I, I told my boss about this about a year, a little more, a little more than a year ago, there had been a little blurb in the New York Post about the book, so it, one of the phrases I have in the book is, never surprise your boss. Think of them as kind of furry woodland animals. <laughs> don't surprise them. They don't like surprises. So I went into Vic Ganzi, our CEO, and I said, you know, you've probably heard a little bit about this book. And he said, it's not about Hearst, is it? I said, Vic, look, you know, I may not be the smartest person on the globe, but I'm not stupid. I love my job. No, this is not about Hearst at all. This book is written for your twin 29-year-old daughters. Because I think that when someone is about that age, they're beginning to think about choices. They're beginning to think about life, how much do they want kids, family, partner, husband, wife, whatever. But it also, I think, was about how do you advise somebody of the things that they're interested in. So many people, I remember when my niece was in college, she said in her senior year, she sort of awakened in the middle of the night one day and said, oh my god, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? And an awful lot of people don't know what they want to do. They don't have that passion. So what I say is, well, think about the things. You're just getting started. Think about the things that you are good at. Because if you're good at something, you probably are going to like doing it. And if you like doing something, you're going to do a good job at it. And then hopefully somebody will kind of recognize that you're really putting a lot into it. It's like, you know, put your all into it. So that's what I really mean about passion. I mean, for me, my career started out more in, in, uh, in, ad sale, in advertising sales. So I sold advertising into Ms. Magazine and New York Magazine with fancier titles. But nonetheless, that's really what I did. And I loved it. And I think if you can like what you do, if you can love what you do, that's like, that's finding the passion within you. Passion's yeah. not going to come from out there, it's going to come from what's inside you. And that, I think, is important to keep really searching for until you can really feel satisfied and, and completed. Because anybody can have a job they hate. You know, well, you, I like to you, say, but you, you know, need to have jobs you love. Well, I like to say also, though, that you can love your job, but your job is not going to love you back. That's so that's true. what you know. We can get to this in a few minutes, but that's the other kind of um, theme in the book, which is the whole: how do you have a 360 degree life? I mean, how do you really make it a full life? Well, so was was Ms. Magazine the first big thing you did? I know you had jobs before that, but. Ms. was, for me, um, I think, a real marker, um, career-wise. It was, uh, I don't think I realized, I was on the sales staff of New York Magazine. I later came back in a very different capacity. Um, but in that era, the women on any ad sales staff at a magazine had like the little accounts. And so, you know, the guys had things like liquor and airlines. So they had the big accounts, which meant you get 
bigger paycheck and bigger commissions, and the women were sort of segregated into sort of handling like boutiques and restaurants and shops. But when Ms. was first launching, I was approached to be, along with some other women, approached to be its advertising director by Pat Carbine, who was the publisher. And Pat and I got to know each other over about a two or three month period. And I, I kept wondering like, well, why isn't she offering me this job? We were like getting to know each other, but there is a point in which like, all right, you know, like come on with it. But I think she realized so much more than I did about how really tough Ms. was going to be. I mean, in the first era of the sort of blush of the woman's movement back in the early 70s, if you saw a picture of anyone identified with the woman's movement, I mean, all the phrases were women's libbers, bra burners, you know, you saw barricades, you saw signs, you saw frizzy hair, work boots, the whole thing. So the stereotypes, I mean, the media really distorted what the woman's movement was all about. So we were so naive. I mean, we, you know, came onto the ad sales staff. We just thought we were going to find a woman in some company and she'd say, well, I want to advertise in Ms., which was a 180 degrees different story than we got. She didn't want anything to do with the woman's movement because yeah. she'd worked harder than anybody to get into that job. And so it was a really tough job. But the great thing about it for me personally was that we had to sort of learn how to articulate our thoughts about women, about the workforce, about women flooding the workforce. We also began thinking about what our own aspirations were. And so for me to be the ad director of Ms., it was the first chance I had to manage people, which I didn't do very well in the beginning as I learned. But more importantly, it sort of began to sort of build my reputation um, on a more national basis in you know, key cities like Detroit and Chicago, that I was somebody that could kind of, that I could handle the pressure. Well, was Gloria Steinem an inspiration then, or was she just a drag? Which no. way? What was she? You no, know, Gloria was amazing. Uh, you know, we were, as I said, we were so naive. If we went on an ad sales call with Gloria, let's just say we thought like four or five people were going to be in this meeting, well, we would come into some company, an ad agency or a company, and there would be like 70 people leaning out of their offices. And you knew what was, it was like that New Yorker, like a cartoon in the New Yorker with the big balloon that goes up like that. You could hear them sort of saying, well, they look OK. I mean, that's really how it was. I mean, they thought we were going to be like freaks and weirdos. So like, if you thought six people were going to come into a meeting, 65 people would be flooding into a conference room. And Gloria had, you know, she's got a great sense of humor. And she could just sort of turn the dynamics of a meeting, which was often, frankly, very hostile. I mean, they didn't want anything to do with this magazine. And she'd sort of have a way of sort of turning it into a way that it became very positive. So it was, it was a very tough five or six years, but I, I it was great. I remember it well, and um, I think of it every time I see Mad Men on <laughs> television where, it you know, was 1959 going into 1960, and those poor women in those offices I don't know if any women like in, this, uh, people in this audience have, have watched that series. It's ended now, but I only caught the last one, but I thought that's exactly how it was when I first went into advertising sales. If you had a lunch date with somebody, they had three martinis, that's right. Or more. You know, the guys were with their briefcases and the women were all typing. Now, what was your, why, what was or is your wildest moment in your publishing career? Like, it's a career that spans Ms., New York Magazine, USA Today, and hers. It's like you succeeded in these big increments. Well, there were some screw-ups along the way, too. But well, well, did you ever stop and bake any cookies or no, do any of that? No, didn't bake any cookies. <laughs> Give us your Hillary Clinton answer. <laughs> I would say that the wildest um, career chunk for me had to be the launch years of USA Today. I mean, it was just a merry-go-round, merry-go-round every single day. I mean, you know, just imagine you're launching a daily newspaper. There is no advertising, none whatsoever, and we had to figure out an advertising strategy. The newspaper was hemorrhaging. And you were working for a madman. I was working for a madman, Al Newharth, who just would not take no for an answer, which is where I finally learned to never take no for an answer. In right. fact, he just I sent a picture, a picture that was taken at a Washington book party of Al and myself down to him a couple of days ago. He just sent it back to me. He said, you didn't inscribe this and tell me how wonderful I am. <laughs> <laughs> But I mean, he was a madman because I mean, he had invested so much. The company was, Gannett, the parent company, was publicly held. He had to go face Wall Street every quarter. Gannett had never had a down quarter. They never supported USA Today um, because it was going to drain so much money from the company. But here we were on the startup team. You know, not just me. I mean, I got a lot of credit. I certainly helped with the, I mean, I helped turn it around on the advertising side, which is obviously a huge revenue stream. But it was a killer. I mean, you know, it, the newspaper was printed by satellite. 
it had to be available at, at, on news racks across this country at 6 o'clock in the morning, and, and if satellite technology didn't exist, it would never have happened. But I mean, he was relentless. What I remember was when I first joined the company, and another guy joined at exactly the same time I did in a slightly different capacity, and we went to our first New Hearth management meeting. And it was in our offices in, in, in New York. Our, we were headquartered in Washington, but it was in New York, which is where I was most of the time. And it was a very dark conference room. And it started at 10 o'clock. And I didn't know this, but Newharth was religiously on time. And he liked to always have people off base a little bit. So inevitably, he would start a meeting early, just to keep people on their toes. Well, I didn't know that. And he would keep it at about 55 degrees. So in any meeting with Newharth, you absolutely were freezing to death. I mean, all you could think about is how damn cold you were. But so I, I'm in my office in a, on a different floor at 54th and Madison. I get a phone call from his assistant. And she says, where are you? I said, well, I'm in my office. Why? And she said, well, it's a quarter of 10. I said, well, isn't the meeting at 10? Everybody's already assembled. You know, I go up there. And Newharth is at one end, and everybody's down here. And he would spend a lot of time on where people sat. He was fanatic about some details. It was like the old plates where you slide a person's name in, so he would figure out where people are going to sit. So I'm the newbie here, and the other newbies across from me. And he takes a what looks like a medical bill, the ones that are perforated on the edges. And he slowly sort of takes this thing. I have no idea what he's doing. And he takes this thing like this, and he opens it up, and he screams some profanity, and wads the thing up, and says, how is anybody going to subscribe to this newspaper if it looks like a medical bill, for Christ? And he throws it at the circulation director, who is like cowering in his seat on the other side of the room. And the newbie guy and I look at each other, and the look on both of our faces is like, oh my god, what have we gotten ourselves into? And that was just like an easy story. That you know, I, I told about the, the, um, uh, the Last Supper in the book. Do you want me to elaborate on that? No, or let's, go, get to it? let's okay. go on a little okay. with, I want to ask you, Catherine Hepburn was famous for saying that women can't have it all. I mean, this was one of her theories. You couldn't, couldn't have a career and children and make it all work. And then uh, that other superwoman, Barbara Walters, finally decided you could have two out of three. You could have a great marriage, great job, no kids. Not, you know, that was the parlay. But you seem to have a 360 degree idea that women can have it all. Well, I Is think that just you, Kathy, <laughs> who can have it all? And my kids better not answer this question, please. Um, what I like to say is this is a very, personal decision. So I don't think a blanket, can you have it all or can you not have it all, is sort of, it's not like one-stop shopping. You've got to look inside of yourself. In fact, I think Oprah's phrase of live your best life is really very important here. What I like to say is you can have it all but not on the same day. And there's going to be days <laughs> when it completely falls apart, you know, when someone's sick or doesn't show up or your children really need you or you've got a flight to take or your flight's late coming home or any of that kind of stuff. But I decided in my early 30s or mid 30s that I really, I was divorced at the time, that I really did want children. It was very important to me. Uh, we ended up adopting two great kids, my, my new husband and I, which was now 25 years ago. And you adopted the first one when you were starting a new job. Well, you? about a year into it, which was pretty wild at USA Today, but we, we managed through it. But I think the thing that is so important is that it takes a village. And that is an African proverb, even though Hillary wrote a book. But I think it, it, it does take a village. And it's not about love being up in, in little boxes. It is allowing other people to really help you with your life. And so in the early days, it was my in-laws plus a nanny. Over the years, it's been a nanny and other people. And I think, you know, knock on wood, our kids seem to be in pretty good shape. So I think everybody has to make that decision really for themselves. Right. Kathy, I want you to think hard on this question. Be honest now. Is it harder to be a boss of men or of women? You know, honestly, I think they're both um, challenging in, their, in different ways. Um, I don't think that it's as much about gender, but I do think that they want to be treated somebody, somewhat differently. I think that women are generally going to respond to something on a more personal level. They are going to take it more personally than a guy. Well, I like to say, you know, a guy hears a criticism and he just blames it on somebody else and keeps on moving. Oh, that's great. <laughs> you, know? you know, we're well, as, as females, we're like rolling it over in our minds over and over and over and over again. Could I have done that differently? What did I do? Why didn't I do that? The guy has blamed it on somebody else. Kathy, so what would happen if the hearse? <laughs> 
Hearst organization if all of the men there disappeared. You are already virtually a boss of a oh, largely I, I, female I hope, business. I hope the guys won't disappear. I mean, I think that the that a you know a, a mixture of genders I think makes for a, a really good and productive workplace and has a little tension going on, which I think is right. a good thing. But does everyone in the world have a boss? Do you have one? Absolutely. I report to Vic Gansey. Vic Gansey reports to our board of directors. Um, so I mean, everyone's got a boss in one form or another. Kathy, you always seem almost happy-go-lucky to me, and I know you're. I know you're not. Maybe it's just. <laughs> maybe it's just your delight that you produce this book because writing a book does make you feel swell for a few minutes. Yeah. So. <laughs> so Until I was you read saying, a book review, go like, oh, yeah. you said that about my book. <laughs> but d do you know that you sometimes have a rep reputation for being chilly and frosty and, you know, cracking the whip? Yeah, what but, do you, you know, think about that? Um, I don't think it's as true today as it was when I was first starting out and thought I had to be. I remember shaking a man's hand one time, and he said, I mean, he, I think I nearly broke it. And he said, you, know, you really don't have to do that. And I thought, oh, yeah, right, he's right. You know, I was like <laughs> wanting to be like tough and aggressive. <laughs> you know, and I, you know, I think I kind of you know, smoothed off some of those rough edges as I, as I moved along the career ladder and realized that I didn't have to be a guy that actually being a woman was equally important and more important to be who we are. Um, so I actually think I'm very approachable. I think I'm adorable. Well, yeah, I think so too. Uh, let's take attitude. You know, the, the word attitude now comes off like a pejorative. Uh, someone in your office hard to get along with, and so we say they have a lot of attitude, and we don't like it. We're not going to put up with it. But what do you think about attitude? Maybe you didn't mean it that way in your book. Well, I, I would look at it in two ways. Number one, you can have attitude, which I think is a positive thing. What I mean by that is you exude confidence and you exude a, a positive way of looking at something. People like to be around people who are positive. So a negative attitude I've always felt is like cancer or the flu in an office. It spreads like wildflower. And I think you want to pluck those people out. Not that I don't like tension. I like different kinds of people to, to create that kind of uh, robust atmosphere. But I think you can have attitude. I think people kind of, you know, but it's not about copying an attitude, which is a phrase more like today. Yeah. I think it's just like looking like they've got some attitude. That, that's not a bad thing. You know, if yeah. it were applied to a guy, they'd say that's cool. Applied, you know, there's that, I, I can't find that list of um, attributes that are, you know, like 10 different things when applied to a woman are criticism, when applied to a man or a compliment. You know, That's we've all true. read that. I just can't find it. I wanted to go find the original. So I think having an attitude is a good thing. Do you ever find yourself flirting or behaving in a kind of coy manner with men you encounter in business? You know, I found in my early days, back before women's liberation, that <laughs> it paid off big for me, whatever few <laughs> feminine wiles I had. But that was a different time frame from now. So oh, do, sure. you, do you think? Oh, yeah. uh, I think that, that most women in business um, you know, know that, I mean, we are women, we are female, and how you can use that to your advantage uh, without you know, kind of going overboard. I think it's a positive thing, and guys do the same thing. Kathy, we had a, this question backstage before we came on. We said, with the word recession looming, what is it you intend to do about it for us, Kathy? <laughs> oh, I'll fix all of those ills. Um, I'm going to sell a lot of books, which will help the recession. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, you say this thing in the book about not taking no for an answer, finding a way to get it done, all of it, no excuses, which is part of the Al Newharth legacy. but. Everyone doesn't have this kind of driving temperament, and doesn't no sometimes mean no? Yes, I mean, of course, there, there's always that moment when no means you absolutely cannot do this. But I think what that helps you understand is occasionally that is absolutely correct. But there's no reason to not go back to your office and figure out another way around it. So it's, I think it's about being smart about figuring other ways to go around a particular situation. Um, but you have to be smart enough to know when do you stop pushing back. I mean, when do you have to like chill, right. say, okay, didn't get it this time, but I'm going to think about another way to do it. So part of it is really learning how, and I think with maturity, you know, with age and maturity and responsibility and experience, I wouldn't you begin, know anything about that. 
one begins to understand one's limitations, and if you have limitations, and we all do, you know, how do you surround yourself with other people who can help you, you know, move something forward or advance something right. forward, or you figure out, you know, you're, I think you get a better feel and a touch. I mean, you can tell pretty quickly if somebody is very distracted in a meeting. I talk about this in the book. If someone's very distracted in a meeting, make your meeting short. You know, or if they're answering their telephone call or whatever, you know, doing their BlackBerry, I mean, you know, they're not paying any attention to you. So you could say, you know, why don't I come back on another day? Uh, right. Then they're embarrassed a little bit, and either they'll give you more attention. So I think it's trying to it's trying to get a, like a touch and a feel, and I think that comes with experience. Well, explain what does don't personalize things that aren't personal. What does that mean for you? That's a big one of the wonderful things in the book. Well, I think women um, have a terminal case of doing that. Uh, actually, Gloria Steinem once said that women had a terminal case of gratitude, which you know we were so thankful and happy for having gotten you know that quarter of a loaf of bread somewhere along the way that we just you know gushed and gushed and gushed. But on the personal side of it, what I mean is don't take things personally. I think women tend to sort of think, oh, I wasn't invited to that meeting. Why wasn't I invited to that meeting? And then they like you know storm around all afternoon. I said to somebody one time said, you know, I wasn't invited to that meeting. Why wasn't I invited to that meeting? I said, well, go to the meeting. Well, I wasn't invited. Well, so what? No one's going to know that you weren't invited to the meeting. You know, it's like an oversight. Think of things like an oversight. You know, people go off to lunch and they think like, why didn't they invite me to lunch? Well, don't flatter yourself. You know, maybe they weren't even thinking about you at the time. So yeah. again, it's, it's all about sort of how do you live in a, in a sort of a grudge-free zone and how do you move things forward without torturing yourself thinking that it's always all about yourself. But if you really want to do something, or if you are offended, you could say to somebody, you know, I was really offended. The three of you walked down, and nobody thought to ask, you know, to extend right. an invitation to me. The three people might say, oh, my God, I never even thought about it. We were, like, talking about a project or something like that. Well, again, this is what you say about figuring something else out, figuring it out another way. Mm -hmm. uh, it isn't like you just had big box office successes over and over. You did have a failure in your... Oh, I've had more your life. than a couple. No, I only think of one. That was the, <laughs> that was the flop of Tina Brown's talk magazine. And as Tina wasn't really the type to have a flop, nor was Harvey Weinstein, nor, was her nor are you, just tell us a little bit about that. Well, Why did it go wrong? I think talk magazine went wrong for a couple of reasons. Uh, and Tina is a brilliant editor-in-chief. She obviously has a hugely successful book with the Diana Chronicles. She's a great writer. However, we came in long after the original business plan was done. So we kind of came in to do the back office, if you will. We were never a partner in the beginning. So Harvey Weinstein and Tina had created the concept for the magazine, created the business plan, and all of that. We are much harder, I mean, Harvey Weinstein is a very hard-nosed guy, but we're a very hard-nosed publisher. And it, you know, it doesn't take a genius to figure out, is a magazine getting traction or is it not? And you get traction by looking at circulation in particular your newsstand sales, or your subscriber response. What ended up with talk, and maybe it was before its time, but I remember Tina saying, you know, it's hard to do this in a monthly magazine. I mean, she wanted it to be kind of like the talk of the town. Well, that's hard to do, and this was just really in the earliest days of the internet. But the magazine was successful to some extent in New York and Los Angeles, because that's, that was the kind of magazine it was. But that's fine if you have a business plan that will support a 200 or 250,000 circulation magazine. Uh -huh. But they had a financial structure and cost structure that would mean like a million circulation magazine. So you have to watch these metrics. Is the circulation really working? Is, are the newsstand, is, you know, is it selling at the newsstand? Do the, if you will, do the dogs like the dog food? And after the first huge blaze of PR, and it was unbelievable in the beginning, as you'll remember, the newsstand sales started falling. Now the advertising was beginning to come in, but not flooding it. So as we sort of tracked it over a two-year period, it's not like we closed it in you know 90 days. It was at you know it was publishing it for a, a good shot. You pretty much know what's going to happen. I mean, is this going to be a significant profit maker, or is it going to kind of plop along? And finally, you know, we had to come to agreement, and it was not our pushing Harvey or Harvey pushing us. It really was a, a mutual decision. But unfortunately, I was the one who had to go down and tell them it was over. 
Well, you have a lot of wonderful advice in the book about difficult things like that, or like firing people or... Well, you know, I think, you know, the, you know, the buck stops at the no. top at a, yes. at, a, at, a, at a particular time. And, you know, it's interesting, a, a couple of weeks ago I ran into my old boss, George Hirsch, who was the publisher of, of a New York magazine you mentioned about firing, and his wife said to me he hadn't fired anybody in a really, he's been retired for quite a while, he hadn't fired anybody in a really long time in one of his philanthropic activities, he had to do something. And so she said, I read him the chapter, I mean, he read, he read me the chapter on firing, and so many people have mentioned the thing on firing to me, because I said to George, in this litigious world we live in, you know, you never fire somebody just yourself. You want somebody else in that room. And I said, secondly, most importantly, make it quick. Because once you've said to somebody, this situation isn't working out, it doesn't matter if you have a 10 minute speech. They don't hear the rest of what you say. They, yeah. have, they have checked out. Yeah. Uh, just one more word about talk. Uh, you have a great quote in the book. It said, never give a party that's greater than the movie. That was David Brown. That's a David quote. Brown line. And, and, and the opening party for talk was greater than talk ever became. I mean, there will never be a better party. Uh, right. And even Tina quotes that in interviews right. that she has done, even though uh, you know she's, she, she'll never forgive me for having closed it. Um, but actually, she was <laughs> up with our editors not long ago to talk about the Diana Chronicle, so it was fun. Oh, I'm sure. Uh, I want to just, uh, we'll talk a few minutes more, but I want you all to, in the audience to be thinking about your questions because you can really put the clamps to this woman. She's tough. <laughs> and uh, so you think about what you might want to ask her. We'll have about a 20 minute question in, in a little while. Kathy, I want to know, are you totally fearless? Meg Whitman says you are, and you do have a really strong, aggressive, uh, reputation. Do you like that? Do you like your reputation? I like my reputation and I like being fearless. I mean, I like being able to, you know, really go for something, but it's not just about Kathy. I mean, you, you, you can't be fearless if you don't have a team of people who have bought into your vision and have bought into your strategy. So you give credit to a lot of the organizations. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think been... you can't succeed if you don't have great people with you who believe in what you're doing, um, who are going to make it happen in their own way with you. Um, and that's really what I've done you know, at each stage of my career. You know, I've always felt that if you're a strong, confident person, you have strong, confident people who are great at what they do. And that's how you have big successes. You can't do it by yourself. Can you think of an instance, uh, I'm not jumping on guys here, but because oh, go ahead. women, well, because women executives you know, they have always got a lot to answer for, whether they were sweet and charming enough that day, and things that they'd never ask of a man. But can you think of an instance when a man in business pushed you and you pushed back? Uh, yeah. I, I mean, mean loads wasn't of times. there an instance when you first went to USA Today where there was some guy who was, he was not happy you were there and he wasn't going to make you welcome? He certainly didn't. And how did you overcome that? Well, I, uh, I mean, let me set the scene here because it was really horrible. Newharth hires me to be president of USA Today after a series of meetings. I was so dazzled with the title of president, it never occurred to me to ask him who reported to me. I just assumed everybody did. Mistake number <laughs> one. So I'm hired in New York. Um, I resign. They have sent a plane for me. I fly down to Washington. They're having a big luncheon celebration, but nobody knows. All they know is that there's some news, but they don't know what it is. And there's like 60 journalists in a, in a uh, dining room. And uh, this red-faced, sweating guy, whom I knew about 10 or so more years my senior, takes me aside, literally as I'm about to go into this luncheon, and he said, I just want you to, he was the advertising director of the newspaper, I just want you to know that I had dinner with Newharth last night, and I don't report to you. And now I'm walking into this room with this big smile on my face as the <laughs> president of USA, and this, I won't call him what I felt like calling him, has just said that to me. Now, Newharth <laughs> is very cunning. You yes. know, he, he moves hats around. Probably like making the problem. He absolutely, I mean, he knew this was going to be huge, but he timed it in a way that I couldn't deal anything. I mean, the press release was out. Here I was walking in. So, I mean, I knew I had to fix it. So I was steaming mad and said that to Newharth later on, and he, you know, kind of blew it off. But, I, I mean, this man, made, this man made my life miserable. I actually made his life miserable also. But the point here is that you cannot have two bosses 
um, trying to tell people to do two different things. And this, a, a staff senses that right well, away. Well, I'm sure Al intended for you to make it all sift oh, down. Did, you know, I'm sure that was all a plan of I, his. I'm not sure that what, it was, what happened. I think that he, you know, he was about let the best man you know, fall or let the best man rise right. ahead. And so I finally said to him, look, we've, but we, we came, this other, the new B guy that I mentioned a few minutes ago, we came up with a plan for this man because he was well known in the advertising business. I would never have hired him for that job to be in a startup of USA Today's dimension, but that's beside the point because they had hired him. Um, we came up with a new job for him. And there's a lesson in that, so which is- So you saved his face, sort of. Yes, I wouldn't have, but we decided that was the best approach. More importantly, take your boss solutions, not problems. Uh, yeah. And it's great. That's a really good lesson that comes out I of agree. that story. You don't want to dump your problems on your boss's lap. That's not why they're there. You should come up with two or three solutions and say, let's talk about what's the best way out of this. Because then, frankly, they save face because he's invested a lot in whatever the decision was, not just about this particular guy, but whatever the particular situation is. It's a very good life lesson. You inevitably, usually, encounter some bad things in business, is my experience. So I want to know, when that happens to you, aside from this one example you've given us, which is a great example, do you turn the other cheek? Do you ignore these people, or do you try to kill them? What do you do? <laughs> you know, every situation is different. Um, I think you, there are times when turning the other cheek is the most productive decision because it's just a lot of time wasted and maybe you can't solve it at that moment. Um, but you do have to fire people um, or you do have to move them to a different job. I mean, you have to just keep, you know, whatever the goal is that you've set out to accomplish, you have to keep that in mind. You have to keep thinking, what do I need to do? What does our team need to do to keep, to keep moving forward? And if that's going to be, if that individual is going to be a huge impediment, then you have to either remove them from the situation or get them turned around. I mean, sometimes they'll turn around. Yeah. You know, our friend Joni Evans wrote a piece for Oprah's magazine called, it was about revenge mm. being sweet. So <laughs> have you ever operated in a manner where you got to take revenge? Well, I would say that when we moved this guy to a different job, that was revenge. <laughs> okay. Now, everything you read these days is about the internet. When I pick up the New York Times, half the time I don't know what I'm reading because I don't know too much about the internet. Uh, is print going away, Kathy, and are magazines going to die? Well, we will have the best year in the magazine division's history in 2007. So I really do believe that the future of print is very positive. However, it means that magazine editors today are very challenged to be dealing with a younger generation coming up who lives on multi-platform media constantly with a television on, a laptop on, an iPhone, internet, Blackberry, you name it. Um, but we have wonderful websites for all of our magazines. We're very excited about that. And I probably spend 20 to 30 percent of my day in some form or another dealing with things digital. So you've got to move forward. You've got to be able to be a change agent. You know, a couple of years ago, I think a lot of traditional editors in chief were very nervous about, you know, would the internet put us out of business? Now, I mean, some magazines will close, others will, you know, others will launch. Um, but no, I, I really do believe that in 10 or 15 or 20 years, we will still be reading magazines. Because I think there's a, a connectivity, a connection that you have with your favorite magazine, which you really enjoy. I mean, you reach out and you seek to read it. So I feel very positive about it. Um, and I know that Hearst has a, a large uh, operating arm now for the internet and oh, for development in these areas. And I helped recently with your uh, Daily Green, mm -hmm. your new environmental website. That was lots of fun. Are you still uh, friends with most of the people who mentored you, who loved you, who advised you, encouraged you, who hated you in the business? <laughs> Um, yeah, Do you I have, have uh, old friends? I have lots of old friends. I mean, Pat Carbine, the publisher of Ms., yes, George Hirsch, whom I woman. just mentioned, Joe Armstrong, you know, Rupert Murdoch, whom I work for. I wouldn't consider him a friend, but, you know, there's certainly a nice, you know, business relationship. So, you know, I, I, don't, I don't have a whole um, coffin full of, uh, you know, uh, mentors that I never acknowledge. Well, you're considered a goddess by many people. You're sexy, you're smart, you're good looking, you have a great marriage, you have wonderful kids, you have your career. 
Are you a pragmatist at heart, or are you a romantic? I was going to say, first of all, don't believe all of that stuff. But um, <laughs> I, I think I'm more pragmatist than romantic. You do. If your fa marriage, for instance, had failed while you were climbing to the top, would it did my first one. Your first. <laughs> well, I must say, would Basic Black have been a different kind of book? How much can a person? I guess what I'm asking: How much can a person let their private life intrude on their work? Well, I think you have to be very careful about uh, letting your private life intrude on your business life. I mean, it is a business setting. It is not a place to spend all day long, you know, kvetching about your spouse or your boyfriend or your girlfriend right. or, you know, whatever. I mean, you, you are there to get a job done. So, you know, I'm happy as anybody else to do a little gossip. I mean, that's always fun, but I don't want to spend 20 minutes at the beginning of every conversation or meeting, gossiping or dealing with somebody's personal issues. Um, you know, it's like we're here for business. So how was Thanksgiving? It was great. And then it's yeah. kind of like, you know, move on. Uh, when, you were, it, when you're working, when a person is working to establish something with somebody, say it's a candidate or a merger or a job or whatever, why do you advise taking three meetings if possible and making one of them a meal? Did well, that it, question make sense? Well, it was really about um, interviewing. Yeah, and ideally, right. if you're interviewing a candidate, uh, particularly if it's for a senior position, but ideally it would be for any position, not exactly any position, but anyway. Um, you know, the first time you meet somebody, you're trying to impress them about the job that you have, and they're trying to impress you about themselves. That's number one. Number two, so you haven't kind of dug behind, beneath the surface very much. Uh, the second meeting takes something to sort of a second, uh, you know, to another level. And then, you know, you're beginning to see things about the person that you didn't perhaps notice the first time. They may either be positive or negative. The reason that um, I talk about a meal is that then you see if well, there's... Well, are you talking more from the employer's point yeah. of view? Yeah. Then you see whether somebody can keep a conversation going on a slightly more social level. You know, are they an interesting person to be around? Because if you're a senior level person, yeah. that's a very critical part of the business, at business entertaining and, and all the rest of it. And then, I mean, frankly, you're, you know, can they hold a fork? Can they cut a knife? A knife? Did, have they had three drinks by the time you get right. to the table? So you're sort of looking I at think, all these I kinds of things. I think it's just a great piece of advice. I just love it. Well, what is, explain this, the grudge-free zone. What is that? Well, women in particular, I think, tend to hold grudges. And again, it all kind of comes back to it's about moving forward. And grudges can, I think, be a negative, uh, a negative effect, ha can have a negative effect on who you are and the environment in which you're working. And so I just say, like, let it go. I mean, let it go. It doesn't matter. So you had a fight with somebody. All right. You don't keep it with you for the next five years. You don't shut them out of your life. I mean, that's not going to be a productive uh, tool for your own development of your own kind of personality or your own productivity in the office. So that's why I say live life in a grudge-free zone. I don't mean that in a kind of simplistic way. It's just it's a more positive way to live one's life. And a lot of what I talk about in, in Basic Black is it is motivational. I mean, I say, you know, it's, it's kind of like a survival guide for the younger woman, and it's a refresher course for somebody that's kind of like saying, oh, I hadn't thought about that in a long time. And so the people sort of pick up on these phrases and say, like, I, I love that. It's like, you know, I think about that stuff that I keep kind of keep regurgitating over in my mind. It's like, let it go. Well, yeah, I was particularly impressed with uh, your chapter about uh, how to treat your detractors, your enemies, and the people who are trying to bring you down and so forth, which is a part of this, of course. But uh, I had just done a, a, a little answer on this for Charles Grodin for the book he's written about. It's called If I Knew Then or something. And, it, and it's about letting go oh, of these really? things, of the people who wronged you. You can't always get, get, get your own back right, right. away. Well, I, I had lunch with somebody not long ago who reminded me about some problem we had probably 15 years ago, literally. And I was like, oh, I can't believe you're like still thinking about that. And that's what I mean about you get frozen. And so it's like, leave it. You say true power is not exemplified by cracking the whip and uh, 
So what is your position on power? Well, I, I quote Jeff Immelt, who is the chairman and CEO of General Electric, who said, you know, I never sought, I know I have a powerful job, but I never sought power. And I think that that's, I mean, it's, it's the most, it, it's the shortest and most coherent way of saying exactly the way that I would feel like that. I don't think that I set out to have power. You know, there are 2,000 people approximately who work for Hearst Magazines. So, I mean, yes, I have the ability to, you know, hire and fire, but it's not about that for me at all. It's about, you know, loving what I do and really wanting to excel and, and to succeed. But if you are only seeking power, I think you're going at it for the wrong reasons. And so I, I want to look at something about, I want to look at, at something for, you know, what do I get out of it? as opposed to just seeking something that's sort of artificial. Because power on its own right, you know, in the old days, I think it was very hierarchical. You know, men had the kind of corporate office and the perks that went with that. And I think women have brought a whole other sort of EQ, sort of the emotional uh, qualities, emotional quotient, into the sort of, into the, into the workplace. And I think that's, it's just so much more satisfying. So, you know, it's not that I'm avoiding the word power. It's just that it's not, it, that that's not, a, it's not a critical motivator for me. You know, I was very impressed to have, I mean, I've known you a long time in a sort of superficial way, but I was really impressed when I asked you if you would let literacy partners uh, honor you. And uh, naturally, these are the kind of requests that uh, people at the top get all, they get 17 a day from every charity and so forth. So you were great because you didn't say, oh, Liz, we're friends, I'll do it for you. You didn't say you wouldn't do it, you, but you were intensely skeptical about whether it could be work. And so we were able, because you left the door a little open uh, without just mm. saying, oh, this is out of the question, I'm too busy. Uh, you let, we were able to work it out, and you were one of the most wonderful people we ever honored. So that, that was a good example. Well, you know, also when you think about, um, you're being very modest, but what, to the audience, what Liz has done with Literacy Partners over a 40-year oh, period. Point. No, it is a point, though, because I, you know, I'm about the written word, and I care <laughs> about, you know, literacy, so it was a, it, it made sense, too. Uh, we could stay here all night, and I could, uh, I could do five or six questions on practically every page of this book. Uh, most of these books that tell you how to, you you just don't have patience with them. I don't know why this one is so effective and so much fun to read. I, I guess there's a lot to identify, either for those of us who felt we've already had our shot or for ones who are hoping to learn something from you. And I'm certainly hoping to learn Well, a lot I think from one you. of the things that I really tried to do in the book was to be very honest because I think we really we learn from somebody else's being honest That's about true. mistakes made or things that they'd like to have done differently or whatever. And that, that kind of refrain has come back to me a lot, like, God, I can't believe you said that in that book. Well, it was a part of my growing up. Well, you, in a funny way, you have an ideal job from my point of view. I've always been such a magazine junkie. I'll, uh, I, the only other person I met who was a bigger reading junkie of junk than me was Richard Burton. He said, my God, if I sit down at the table and there's nothing to read, I read what it says on the ketchup bottle. <laughs> so I was just, uh, I mean, I love, uh, I love the job you have. I think it's, it's really too. great. And I want to ask you, it. what is your favorite magazine? <laughs> oh, I couldn't do it. What is your favorite magazine at, well, at, that Hearst publishes? That would be a little like saying, which of my 19-year-old children is my favorite? <laughs> However, my standard answer Oh, you're going to tell us your favorite, not your favorite child. but is Popular Mechanics. <laughs> it usually gets a little giggle. And I hear it keeps popular, me out of trouble. And Popular Mechanics is having its biggest year in a it decade is. It's, or something. And it's over 100 years. We have six titles over 100 years of age. Well, now it's your turn, dear darling audience. So I want you just, I can't see you. But, no, you can't. Uh, They're all sleeping, Liz. Oh, there they are. <laughs> God. <laughs> okay. Just stand right up and shoot us down. Who would you have dinner with, Kathy? If you could, they asked me to repeat the question. I don't know why. Who would I have dinner with? Um, you can change the answer tomorrow, but the 
<laughs> Let's see. Uh, well, since you mentioned Richard Burton, that'd be kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah, I could handle that. Um, Winston Churchill. And probably because she was such, uh, she was so heroic, uh, probably Catherine Graham. Yeah, and you list her yeah. her book. As, right. Kathy, you need another person, Kathy. It's only three people. It's a, we'll only mention two people. You need to mention another well, one. You, oh, you said Richard Burton doesn't count. And, Win and Winston <laughs> Churchill and Catherine Graham. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. See, I can't count. That's why I couldn't <laughs> do your job. I'm sorry. Uh, okay, who else? Yes. Well, we have certainly seen in our own company, um, and I talk about, and I certainly that week talked about that with, with a lot of people that I encountered that week. There's no question that I think somebody that's under the age of 29 or 28 has an entirely different set of expectations. And I mean, I hope they can change the workplace. You know, it's, but it's a huge challenge. I mean, you know, we publish monthly magazines. You know, we have closing dates. We have production schedules. And so accommodating everybody's desires to do flex time at home or you know work a shortened work day and all of that it's it's going to be a huge challenge so i don't think they're going to find it as easy as they expect um, because you know for th that percentage of them who do want that there's going to be another percentage that are going to say well that's fine but i want i want to go for it but you know good for them if they can you know when we read the statistics about so many women checking out of huge corporations um, because they're so inhospitable uh, in fact, I, I saw something in the paper the other day. It's, it's a little bit off the point, but, but you'll understand what I mean. There's a new website. I can't remember what it's called, but they have analyzed the diversity statistics at law firms. And so there's this like little hidden website. So if you're applying, I mean, if you're interviewing with law firms, you can see what percentage of uh, you know, uh, young lawyers there, you know, are, come from diverse backgrounds and how many are, have become partner and whatever. And it's become like this kind of, you know, um, hot website because it helps you sort of see what kind of company, I mean, what kind of law firm is this. So and there's going to be a lot of things like that that are going to change over the next decade, or I hope so. Okay, let's start over there. I'm pointing at you. Hi. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Um, I would say that um, I'd answer that in a couple of ways. I think first of all, at different stages of your career, um, you need different kinds of advice. I never had a formalized mentor. I've never been in a company where there was a formalized mentor program. Um, although we've just introduced one at Hearst on an, a more informal basis, but we're creating a series of lectures and if somebody does want a mentor, they can have one. But I don't think anybody honestly wants somebody in their office or in their cubicle at 4 o'clock on Monday afternoons to talk about their career. You know, but I think you, could, you can pick out somebody and say, you know, I'd love to occasionally talk to you about where my career is going, get some advice from you, or get some feedback from you. I think that's fine. But your own circle of friends is also going to be equally helpful. But you know what, at, at 28 or 29, you may want one kind of mentor. And at 35, if things are stalled for you for whatever reason, you may want a different kind of mentor. So I think it's not going to be one person kind of following your, your career. Was there someone behind you also asking the question? I thought I saw two hands there. Okay. Yes. I'd like to ask you on a more personal note. Um, as far as the whole passion for your job and everything, and then your husband, especially if you have a husband like mine that when I overflow with that, that I see this wave look go over his eyes. Mine too. Do 
you know, I don't think it could be every night to be overflowing. Um, but I, I said this to a group of uh, uh, White House fellows about a month ago, which are people that are sort of mid-career, so give or take in their 30 to 35-year-old. About half of them were women, half of them were men. Maybe there were about 20 of them. And I said, you know, there's a huge difference between having a spouse who accepts what you do, that was husband number one, or is really supportive of what you do. And it's a very subtle but fine line. Uh, my husband, Tom, to whom I've been married for 25 years, you know, is very enthusiastic about what I do, but he's not trying to do it for me. I can talk about a problem in the office or whatever, but you know, you have to realize that, you know, they're only, you know, they're there, they're, you know, you're having a nice dinner together. So, you, I mean, you can't every single night be unloading everything that didn't work out. So I think you have to kind of judge it for yourself as, as, as you know, as, as well. Is that an answer? Yeah, right. Yes. Um, I'm very proud to be a member of the Coca-Cola board. I've been a member since 1990, uh, 1991. Um, you know, there's, if, if this were a shareholders meeting for any large corporation, often they're handing out flyers for one particular issue or another. I have nothing to do with what they're talking about, so I didn't even know anything about it. Yes. Was there someone behind you, too? That's, yes. You know, it depends. I mean, if, if, if someone is coming to me individually, um, probably I would suggest less is better. Um, you know, assume you're going to have somebody's attention for 15 minutes. You know, I think we live in a shortened time frame today. You know, in the old days, we would give presentations about our magazines. It would be 35 minutes, and we thought every word was perfect, and we couldn't ever shorten it or edit it. And now people don't want that. I mean, it can be a laptop. It can be just a little you know, a, just a little deck of some sort. But, you know, if you come into someone's office and they see a deck that looks like that, guess what is going through their mind? Oh, no. <laughs> they don't want that much. So it's trying to figure out, you know, what are the, what are the cogent points of what it is that you're trying to really present um, and doing it in the most effective way possible, but always watching their body language. Because if you get it, that sense and if you get that touch, you will see if they're with you or if you've lost them. So I, sometimes I'll say to, a sec, to an assistant on the telephone, or my assistant might say that to them, but in any event, you know, uh, what is, let's just say it's a pretty important presentation. Um, what is, you know, Ms. or Mr.'s next appointment? What time is it? Let's just say a one o'clock appointment. If they've got a two o'clock appointment, you know, you pretty much know you're gonna have maybe 30 minutes, because they don't wanna spend the whole hour with you, unless it's something that's really, really important. So it's always trying to be respectful of that person's time and trying to figure out your message in less time rather than more time. I talk about in the, in the book of years, uh, obviously this is a long time ago, when I was at New York Magazine, we bought, you know, if I'm gonna tell you all this stuff in the book, no one is gonna buy a book here. Um, when I was working for New York Magazine, we bought a listings magazine called Q, probably be like Time Out Today, and we were incorporating it into New York Magazine, and we had to go make a presentation to Rupert Murdoch. And so my boss and another guy, uh, and I had worked on this whole presentation. We thought we'd probably have 45 minutes with Rupert because we were asking for what we thought was a lot of money to promote the inclusion of Q in New York Magazine for subscription promotion and newsstand and whatever. So we enter Mr. Murdoch's office. I'd only been there a few times, which was down at the New York Post. And he seemed like really far away. And he stood behind his desk and he had these little half glasses on. And we had like this big presentation. And he said to the three of us, I find that when I stand, the meetings are shorter. <laughs> That's great. Okay, how about this side? You know, we'd been up all night long on the damn thing. So between the door and getting in front of his desk, and he stood for the entire meeting, the two guys look at me and I thought, I said, I'll take it. And I just verbalized it for like three minutes, literally three minutes. Rupert, this is this, da -da 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 -da. we need it. And he said, fine, I understand it. And we were out the door like in four minutes. But if we tried to pull out the, the, you know, the flip chart thing, we would have been dead in the water. So it's a, it's a sense as to where you're going. Right in the very back there. We'll, we'll come up. We'll get to you. You talked about the importance of being fearless. Were you always fearless, or was this a process that you went through? And it was a process that you talked about how you actually got there. 
Well, you know, um, I guess I'd answer that in two ways. Number one, um, you know, I told you the, new, the, the selling the subscription story. Um, I loved sports as a child. I mean, I was long before all of the organized sports of today, but I loved to horseback ride. I played tennis. I liked the competition part of that. So I, I kind of have that gene in me that kind of, I think that's kind of in my DNA. Um, but certainly, um, you know, I've been on the firing line for a long time with these sales jobs that I've, advertising sales positions that I've had earlier on in my career, when I really had to articulate what I cared passionately about, you know, trying to convince somebody about the importance of the women's movement, you know, or the importance of this new national newspaper. So it kind of, you know, along the way kind of teaches you. So it's not like you get up one morning and you're fearless, but it is, I think it's a much more sequential kind of, uh, kind of thing. Yeah. That's a great question. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure if everybody heard. Thank you. Um, the question was, you know, how have I sort of gone beyond, you know, where the different group, different uh, jobs that I had, you know, why did I sort of excel when others may not have excelled as much? I mean, again, I would go back to the DNA thing. Um, it was in me to want to be successful, to want more perhaps than other people did, and to position myself in a way where I could achieve that more. Um, I've never said honestly that I've made a lot of sacrifices, and I really don't believe I have, but if somebody looked at my calendar for the last 25 years, they might say, I don't want to have to do that. You know, I mean, at, at, for seven or eight years of USA Today on an airplane three or four times a week, you know, if Newharth called a meeting on a Sunday night, we were in Florida on a Sunday night. You know, not everybody wants that. An awful lot of people would say, you can have that. You can have the pressure. I have the, the makeup to handle pressure without it's collapsing me, and it can really collapse some people. But where it all started, I think, I, I had a, a very strong relationship with my father. He was very encouraging of me, you know, living a big dream and dreaming a big dream. But in my first jobs, I think what I remember most of all, you know, you always think, oh my God, the boss is so smart. I hope there's nobody here that works for me. Um, <laughs> my boss is so smart. And then, you know, like a year into it, you think, oh, I think I might, I get that job. You know, I, I know what they're doing. I, I think I can figure that out. <laughs> you know, and so then maybe you get that job, and then, you know, you kind of look to the next one. And I've said this especially, I think, for women, because I think our careers were much more sequential. We got into a position and saw the next one and said, oh, I can do that. I like doing what I am but I th doing, but I think I can do that one too. You know, I think for guys it was like, you know, you're going to be successful. You're going to be a lawyer. You're going to be a doctor. You know, you can do whatever you want to do. An awful lot of women never had that kind of, you know, kind of spirit that kind of pushed that encouragement of, you know, go for the dream. Well, listen, Kathy, in my p case, I was fired over and over again. <laughs> and it always worked out great. Every time I was fired, I'd get a well, better job, and I, but it wasn't ambition, it was strictly luck. I'm glad, but I, I think that it's really great to hear that because being fired can teach you something. Absolutely. I don't know about getting fired over and over, but um, <laughs> Helen, Helen Gurley Brown actually said to me, uh, she still comes to the office most days, believe it or not, or if not every day, um, but she said to this young reporter that I was mentioning earlier behind stage that she, she had 17 secretarial jobs by the time she was 28. Yeah. But somebody finally took a chance on her. The boss's wife actually took a chance on her. Did we get everybody here? Well, There's all right, we'll take two right. more questions. This lady Don't you on go the home? aisle back here? Yes. Marianne Oh, how are you? <laughs> Hi, Marianne. You remember the Q acquisition? Oh, uh, yeah. Exactly. How about the uh, personal ads you saw? You know, the personal ads. Uh -huh. It was one of the first magazines to do that. I do remember that. To see you be here and see you very inspiring. Oh, great. thank you very much. I love what I always did, so I just, you know, I'm into a new career. And you were great. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Known as a do-gooder, and I was 
thrust into a third career while trying to help a client of mine who was a, an arranger for rap and rock music. And I found out, having written poetry my whole life, I'm good at rap lyrics. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty cool. So, I know I'm not good at that. <laughs> I have an idea, only because there's other people here as well. Um, why don't you read the book, and if, if you get nothing out of it, pass it on to somebody else. Thank you. Also, you know, you all have to keep on keeping on. You might be lucky enough to get fired. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you.